Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on records facility management for your organization. Our presenters are Michael Martin and Keith Sweeney. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be made available on our website and the link will be sent to all registrants when it's available. If you have any questions for our esteemed presenters today, please enter them in the chat box. If you need to access that, you can go down to the bottom right hand of your screen. There's a little bubble that looks like a cartoon word bubble. Click on that. That will bring up your chat screen. Please make sure that you are sending your questions to everyone so that they are seen. If they're not in that area, we may miss them. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So we don't get to it immediately as soon as you type it in, although I do recommend that you do so so you don't forget. We will be getting to them at the end. And without further ado, gentlemen, are we ready? Are we excited? But yes. of course. All right. I'm going to hand present, um, present privileges off to Michael. And away you go, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, so yes, today we are going to be talking about managing your records facility, you know, and managing your facility for your organization. Now, managing records is about more than just the records themselves. You have to think about there's also the management of the facilities where records are stored and preserved. So we're going to talk about some of the basics to provide some helpful solutions to the challenges that are presented by trying to manage your storage facility. We're going to discuss, you know, the organization and access of records, talk about uh, retention period, selection of a records facility, and working with stakeholders and vendors to ensure that the records are safe and easily retrieved. Okay, and as a bo and a bonus, we are going to talk about some of the best practices that we use in the New York State Records Center here in Albany, you know, to help provide some real life examples for everyone. Okay, so here are some of our topics today, you know, some of the things we're going to be talking about. Just the basics of maintaining your inactive records facility. Talking about the benefits, what exactly are the benefits of maintaining these inactive records separate from others and maintaining these separate facilities? Talk about evaluating potential storage facilities. We have a number of suggestions for looking at any potential facility, including a relatively easy to follow checklist. We'll also talk about shelving recommendations. We have specific recommendations for ensuring your shelving is strong and stable enough for your facility to prevent any problems down the road. Nothing worse than having your shelving fall apart on you, right? You also talk about determining space and other considerations. We have some suggestions really for how you can determine space at any potential facility you may have. We'll also talk about the organization of the records. Who is going to do the actual organization of the records and ensure that this material is maintained in your facility? And we'll talk about access, who can and cannot have access to the records, and how to ensure that everybody can get to them quickly. Also, we'll talk, discuss some importance of policies and procedures. We always think it's really important to remind people to write things down so everybody knows what they need to do and where they can find the answers when they have questions. You don't want everybody always constantly running to you. There's someplace else that they can go to. And then finally, we'll wrap up some of the main points we want to make sure that everyone knows and takes away today. All right, so we're going to start off with the benefits, the benefits of maintaining these facilities, the benefits of maintaining these records. First and foremost, the biggest benefit is that you can ensure access of these records ensure the access of the records and the information. And we'll talk about access in more detail a little bit later on. But really, the whole idea is that it saves money. Really, and that, of course, is a huge benefit to any organization, any government, because that's what they're always looking for, right? To save money. So you're saving money on things like storage space and equipment when you consolidate your records into one location. When you dispose of records on time, you also create additional space. And you're saving personnel time 
because people are no longer wasting their own time trying to find records in a number of different locations or by searching in vain through unmarked and unorganized boxes, folders, you know, or, you know, just a facility that's just a complete disaster. It makes you look professional. Really, nothing looks worse than not being able to find something when it's requested by the staff or public. Your organization, your government comes across as unprofessional and simply unorganized. Maintaining these records, the records facilities, which can quickly become a jumble with no structure, can help prevent this. It ensures compliance, okay? It helps ensure that you are compliant with all the local and state laws regarding records retention and disposition. Good files management practices, the separation of inactive and active records, maintaining the facility that keeps those records allows for the efficient disposition of records when they are no longer needed. And it demonstrates transparency. You can easily locate what records are requested and it shows others you have nothing to hide, basically. Unfortunately, we kind of live in a day and age when you can't find something, some people's first inclination is not to think that, oh wait, this was a mistake, or you know something was mislabeled or lost along the way during a transfer no it's that there may be something to hide and because of that we want to make sure that people can find what they're looking for as quickly as possible maybe you get a foil request and if you can't fulfill that foil request we all know the problems associated with that so having these records organized having these facilities organized to make sure that you can find this information will ensure that you can respond to those FOIL requests, for example, in a quick and timely manner. So next question we need to think about is where exactly are you? What does your area, what does your facility look like right now? And really there's a range for these, not surprisingly. And, you know, it goes from the perfect you know, an active record storage area, an active record storage facility. And let me say, I don't expect anybody to have uh, anything that's perfect, but there are some that are awfully close or they're at least perfectly what they need them to be. They can find the records, they're organized and they're secure. And that's perfect enough. Now, maybe, just maybe you have something that was brought up to date years ago but it's been in decline. You know, somebody had been really, really doing a great job in the past. Maybe they received a grant from us, you know, to help put things in order, set up some shelves, what have you, but that person left uh, for whatever reason. And over the years, whatever kind of order that was in place has kind of fallen apart. You know, it's not really been kept up with. And at this point, maybe it's gone to the point of decline where people aren't even sure what they need to do at this point. And then there's always the neglected from seemingly the beginning of time, right? Perhaps nothing has been done at all. Maybe there are boxes strewn across your facility, strewn across the floor, not even sure, you know, not labeled, not organized in any way, look like they're about to fall over you know you have a pretty big challenge on your hands. And most likely, you know, of course, it's somewhere in between, anywhere in between from the total disaster to practically perfection. No matter what, you know, there's always a way that we can improve. Uh, you know, for example, in the State Records Center, you know, staff have implemented a check system where many of our procedures ensure the correct boxes are pulled, you know, a good locator system, that sort of thing. It conforms to the schedule. We know exactly where our boxes are at a given time and can present them. We also have, you know, at the Records Center, we do a daily walkthrough, and we'll talk about this more later on or provide other examples of it. But you can see that daily walkthrough identifies any kind of potential concerns, leaks, problems, and so on. All right, now we're gonna talk about evaluating some potential storage facilities. 
we know about the benefits, okay? So we need to think about where these records can be stored. What kind of facility are you looking at? So how do you evaluate these facilities? Well, again, we have some suggestions. We have a, a publication on inactive record storage that uh, Sarah is going to put in the chat so you can be familiar with it or at least have an idea for the link. And really, part of evaluating these potential storage facilities is using the checklist that we provide. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But as the basic understanding, you know, you need to think about, are you working with a room, an existing uh, local government facility? Are you working with the state record center? You know, get an idea of exactly what you're working with. And then if you are looking at a separate building here, you know, you can have a separate building that's rented or leased uh, that you can store your inactive records in. You know, the one issue with that is the records may not necessarily be on site and you may not have as quick access with. If you are renting a facility, you got to deal with the whole, uh, whole issue that we'll talk about when we get to commercial storage um, as well. Uh, and that's in terms of, uh, access and ensuring access long term and then there's always the whole idea of new construction so this is the most expensive and it's the most difficult to arrange unless your timing is either really good you're very patient and persuasive then there's that whole idea of commercial storage you know it's under the control of the vendor you pay for the storage and services the biggest concerns there are the hidden costs of accessibility. You know, one of the biggest hidden costs is retrieval costs. How much does it cost to retrieve a record from a commercial facility? Make sure you know about that upfront. If you are, if you're local government and you're going to store records at a commercial facility, you need to contact um, our government record services unit, and you can contact your records advisory officer for more information on that. And of course, if you are a state agency, you can always use the state record center. And the other possibility is this whole idea of a storage facility that's shared with another government. You know, it's always helpful to share the costs of setting up that space or you know, using that space, that shared storage. You know, there's no right or wrong approach when it comes to this. And this is where I'm going to do a, a quick shout out to our local government records management improvement fund. Okay, it won't provide for construction of a new facility, but we can help. Uh, we can help provide grants for. Re retrofitting, you know, a current storage area, a current facility for records storage, like providing shelves and maybe an HVAC system or what have you to help stabilize the environment. And if you want inform more, more information on our grants, you can always contact our RAO, uh, your RAO, because unfortunately for state agencies, those grants are not available. So, the what you need to check when you're looking at this facility what we need to look at is you're checking the physical structure of a proposed inactive storage location you need to consider getting professionals involved here these are people who are going to know things that you simply will not they're going to be able to answer some very vital questions this includes building inspectors, fire inspectors, a general contractor, engineers, architects. They can help you determine things that are essential, but you won't know immediately just by looking at things. Like floor strength, wall construction, general structural soundness. They can help evaluate that. Things like foundations, roofs, whether it's a, a vulnerable to floods or other kind of disasters, maybe you know, if there's hazardous materials, that sort of thing. They can identify that. 
they can identify things like the system that you have, whether it's the HVA system, that's the heating and ventilation and air conditioning system that helps keep your climate control, the wiring, the electrical wiring, and the plumbing. At the State Records Center, we use the Office of General Services. They, per, you know, they perform quality checks on our systems overall, and that's also, you know, part of that walkthrough of checking those systems as well on a daily basis. So you need to think about getting those professionals involved because you can't do everything on your own. But to help you and make sure that you're gathering all the information that you need. We have a facilities checklist on that publication that I mentioned. You can use this checklist to evaluate your current or potential inactive records facility. It's thorough and extremely helpful. When I say thorough, you know, it's a couple of pages with a lot of yes or no questions, but it's gonna make sure that you're not gonna miss anything. It also includes the idea that you always want to allow for at least 30% of additional space for future growth when developing any kind of new space or facility. That's essential to remember because you need to have growth. Those records aren't gonna stop anytime soon. Now we are gonna talk about our recommendations for shelving in your inactive record storage facility. Shelving is absolutely essential to any kind of facility and management of electronic uh, management of inactive records. And we want to make sure that you have the information you need to have the correct shelving. Okay, so again, this is discussed in more detail in our publication, but here are our basic recommendations. You want to make sure you have heavy duty steel shelving, 18 gauge or lower steel. And this is simply because over time, anything weaker is going to buckle. Plain and simple, it won't be able to hold up the weight. You're gonna to need to calculate the weight capacity needs and select shelves that are going to meet or exceed them. When we're talking about your weight capacity, you know, you need to think about a standard record storage box. When it's full, it's approximately 35 pounds. So, it depends. Are you going to be using the standard 42 inch wide, 16 inch deep shelf that holds one row of boxes, three across? Then that's approximately 150 pounds. So determine the number of boxes you'll be storing on the shelf. If you're going to be using something larger, like the 42 inch wide double deep, which is 30 to 32 inches, you can stack two high and that'll hold 12 boxes. And that's approximately 420 pounds. And you can see why when we're dealing with these kind of weights, why you need to ensure that you're using steel shelving, because obviously that's pretty, pretty heavy. Some more shelving recommendations, because there's never enough. Larger record centers may consider steel shelving that is eight feet wide. They don't necessarily have to worry about where the doors are gonna be placed or, or anything else. Uh, but if you have a smaller facility, then you might have to think about something that might be a little bit smaller. But the thing we wanna make sure is that you're always having shelving that's deep enough. You need it at least 30 to 32 inches to ensure that it's not going to be, you're not gonna have any kind of overhang for double and for 16, or single storage boxes. Because your typical, and this is what differs between records management and your typical library shelving or, or other things that are designed for not storage boxes, is you're gonna have the box kind of overhanging over the edge, maybe an inch or two. And that's a problem because that's gonna break down the box and God forbid, it can also fall on your head. So you, we wanna definitely avoid that. You also need to think about your standard height, how high you want the boxes and the shelving to go. The standard height, you know, ranges from five to 10 feet with about three or four inches added at the bottom to keep the bottom shelf off that floor. Usually the most common is about six to seven feet high. The other thing you have to remember is you always allow for at least one foot between the top and any kind of lighting, you know, duct work or, or what have you, because 
you don't want your boxes pressed against those sprinkler systems or your lighting or your uh, HVA system ducts. You want to avoid that. So make sure you, you leave some space for that as well. All right, now this is a little bit complicated, but you know we need to determine how do we do figure out how do we determine the space and some other things to consider. When we're talking about determining space requirements, and again, this is in our publication as well in a bit more detail, but a quick overview is there's basically two methods for figuring out space requirements for your facility. The first method is using the following formula. The volume of the records times, you know, is the floor area required. You figure out the height, the ceiling height required, and then multiply by 0.365 and you get the overall volume and capacity. But this accounts for just the aisle space, not additional workspace. The other method is to calculate the cubic feet of your current inactive records and increase that by 30% to allow for cumulative growth. Then divide the total depending on how high you have carton shelves currently. If you want to go eight high, there's a factor of three. 10 high multiplied by a factor of 375, 12, 4, 5, and 4, 4 high, 5.25. And that gives you a basic idea of what kind of volume capacity you're going to need for your records. All right, some other considerations that we need to take into account. You know, the environment. What's the ideal environment to keep your records? Okay. These are optimal conditions, ideal. We recognize that not everybody can meet them, but we do our best to try. The temperature should fall between roughly 65 to 72 degrees, relative humidity 40 to 55. And really the most important thing is to have some kind of environmental control that, that makes sure that there's not wild fluctuations in either. Because the wild fluctuations is what causes problems, the breakdown of the record, you know, the paper records, and also the growth of mold as well. And we need to think about cleanliness. You know, we're talking about your dust and, and everything else that can build up, but also keeping things like food and whatnot out of that area, because that's going to bring in pests, that's going to bring in rodents, and we want to avoid that at all possible. You know, you can have a whole convoluted uh, integrated pest management, you know, system and control to ensure that something like that doesn't happen at the state record center. You know, it's part of the daily walkthrough to check their rodent and insect stations and traps. Air circulation. There always needs to be good air circulation. You know, that's going to reduce the humidity and the chances of mold growth. So. You may need to install ductwork for an HVA system, something like that, if that is necessary. But you want to make sure that you're circling the air in some way, shape, or form. And lighting, of course. Records are not supposed to be exposed to direct light, so you want to make sure the storage, you know, if the storage area has windows, that there are shades, blinds, or you can close off the windows entirely. and security. Security, of course, is always really important. You want to restrict access to authorized personnel only. No one should deposit or remove records without some kind of authorization. You document who has access to the records, and if people take something for whatever reason, that it is documented in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and the only way you can kind of restrict access in many cases is to install locks and keys and ensure only certain people have access to those keys. We're not saying people can't have access to the records. We're just making sure that the people who have access to the records are ensuring that they are being maintained. And then, of course, you know, you can look into the security alarms and cameras. You can get all fancy, you know, but you want to have the basics. And when we're talking about the basics, we're just ensuring safety, right? Because here's a, a good map just showing you the flood plains and danger zones in New York State. And you can see water is a big, huge issue because it practically covers the entire state. Looks like the North Country is relatively safe when it comes to this stuff. 
um, but it's one of the few areas. So safety is very, very key. And when we're talking about safety, we're talking about the whole gambit. We're talking about the health of the people who are working in the environment. So you want to make sure that things like mold and other toxins are not in the air. You want to make sure that you are doing fire prevention, know the local codes and regulations, keep those smoke detectors in, that sort of thing. And then of course, flood. We wanna make sure that people are aware of when things are in a floodplain and what to do if something happens. Because if you have any kind of disaster, you wanna make sure that you've been doing your disaster planning ahead of time. That disaster plan and preparation is key if you have any kind of issue. Because you need a plan in place, people need to know what it is, and they need to have practiced it at least once a year, because if not, when some kind of disaster happens, everybody's kind of just running around saying, what do we do, what do we do? If you have that plan in place, you'll know exactly what needs to be done. Okay, and now we're talking about specific to the operation of your facility. You wanna make sure that you're doing some of the following. You need to consider the transfer of records, the organization of the records, how to access the records by developing some kind of locator systems and then the following following the disposal policies and don't worry about any of these because we're going to talk in detail for each one okay so we're talking about transferring records when we're talking about that you need to think about the following you evaluate your office files for infrequency of use you find out an idea of how often they're being used and when they're moved to your inactive a record storage facility. You know, that can be anywhere from a month to a year. Uh, at the State Record Center, we usually use the formula of anything less than a month per file drawer, and it's moved to inactive. You need to work with the records creators and users. They're gonna the ones who are gonna provide you with the most information about the records before they're transferred to you. And then you create an office retention schedule. This is specific to your office. You don't deal with the whole retention schedule, just the records that you deal with. It's you know kind of a good cheat sheet, and it also provides information about when the records go inactive and what the retention time period is for those records. And then you establish some kind of transfer procedure. You set down in writing what you do when the records are transferred from your office to the inactive record storage area. What forms are needed, that sort of thing. We have examples of those actually. Here's one for a local government, uh, just a basic one, still needs to be updated because we have the MU1 code instead of the LGS1 code, but it gives you an idea of the kind of information you wanna make sure you capture. The department, the date, any kind of box number, a description. We're not talking incredibly detailed here, just some basics. The years are covered, the LGS-1 code for local governments, um, and there's a whole separate one for state agencies, and Keith will discuss that in one moment. Uh, the retention period of your records, the disposition date, when you can finally get rid of it, and the cubic feet. We're assuming that most uh, boxes are record store you know standard record storage one cubic fit per box but that's not always true because we got maps and we got other things and oversize and all that fun stuff so we want to make sure that you have an accurate estimate for the boxes and the number of cubic feet and at this point what i'm going to do is i will hand it over to keith if i can get this to move yes and he will happily continue the presentation Hey, thanks very much, Michael, and thanks again for everyone who joined us this morning. This is an example building off what Michael talked about with local governments of the State Records Center transfer list form, also known as the REC-1, that state agencies use to transfer their inactive files to the Records Center. It contains a lot of the same information as on the local government form, with a couple notable exceptions, including at the top where we ask state agencies to indicate the program unit that they're a part of, and also a line where we ask the agency records management officer to give their approval of the transfer by a signature or at least putting in their name with the date. Also, the information that we, that we request here is a little bit different in that we ask agencies in column eight to put their label number. This is the barcode number for the box. 
we generate these barcode labels in advance of agencies sending records to the state records center. And we track these in our inventory management system. We also ask agencies to supply the box number for that box on the specific transfer list, a description of the records, which is usually a box level description, sometimes a folder level description if the agencies find it to be useful. And finally, information about the disposition of the records. We wanna know the month and year that records can be legally disposed on, plus the authorization number, which would be the state general schedule item number or the agency specific schedule that applies to the records. And there's also a column in column 11, uh, whether the box should ultimately be transferred to our archival holdings. Due to the size and complexity of state government, we now review transfer lists submitted by state agencies before they transfer their records to us to ensure that disposition information matches up with the proposed schedule item. To effectively, the man, to effectively manage records that you transferred in active storage, you need to be able to systematically organize and describe them so they can be identified and retrieved later, whether for a reference request by your agency or local government, or even later on once they've met their legally mandated retention period. This includes the following steps, processing records for transfer, assessing box contents, and developing good box labels. Of course, if you're using the State Records Center or an external vendor, these activities must happen before you transfer records to them because, of course, you'll be giving over physical control of the material. Records must be analyzed and processed as they are pre prepared for inactive storage. This work may be performed by the records management officer or somebody else, but ideally the officer department transferring the records should do this work. As we discussed earlier, they know the records their best. In larger state agencies, we find that the RMO or their designee may facilitate this process while the program units identify records and actually prepare them for transfer, preparing lists and packing them. The first part of this process is to purge any obsolete records as you process them. Deal with these first so that you manage only those records that need to be managed for the long term. To do this, you'll wanna be sure to identify the record series that corresponds to the records by using the appropriate retention schedule Separate records out that can be destroyed up front. For example, if you know records that don't need to be kept for the long term, um, maybe duplicate documents or maybe a series of, say, project files where you know that certain documents have already met their administrative or legal retention period, then you can separate those out and then only manage records that you need to manage for the long term. As you do this, though, it's important to document any disposition that occurs on the records. We'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Obtain authorization for any records that you do destroy at this point in time. It's important, very, very, it's very important legally that this happens. You can't simply have one person making all the decisions about what to keep and what to get rid of. Finally, in destroying obsolete records, be sure to think about your disposition options here. Uh, if you have confidential information that you're dealing with, no matter if it's in paper or electronic form, it must be physically destroyed in a secure way. If records don't contain such confidential information, you can simply have them recycled. And this is a good time to mention that the State Records Center manages a state waste paper contract for state agencies and interested local governments to use. There are some restrictions on it though, depending on your geographic area, and we'd, we'd be happy to answer some more questions about it. But in short, this contract provides for free and secure destruction in a confidential manner of uh, paper records, according to IRS uh, shredding standards. And here's an example of the records destruction authorization form that we have on our website. As we just discussed, it's critical to document any actions and decisions you take in terms of getting rid of records. So you can maintain a disposition log for recording records informally as you process them, and also this destruction authorization form if you do decide to have records destroyed. There's lines on here for individuals to indicate that they authorize destruction or even witness destruction if that's the case. And as I mentioned before, a full sample destruction authorization form is available on the State Archives website for agencies and local governments to use. After you've gone through and, and weeded out those obsolete records, the second step is to process those remaining records or those that you must retain for a period of time 
before destroying or retaining them permanently. And that permanent retention could mean, for example, that you retain them permanently in the agency or the local government, or maybe you transfer them to an archival facility like the state archives, if you're a state agency. Again, it's important to organize your records by record series here. You can determine the appropriate series by checking the retention schedule if a local government would be the LGS-1, or if you're a state agency, the general schedule or an agency-specific records disposition authorization, or RDA. As you process files, be sure to retain the original order of, or sequence of the files. Don't try to impose a new order. If you need access to specific folders, it's a good idea to develop an index, a database or spreadsheet to be able to find those folder titles. Also, don't mix records in from different departments. This will only cause confusion later on, especially at disposition time. As you prepare records for inactive storage, it's important when you box up files to use standard records cartons. And this also prevents the need from having to rebox any files later on. And these cartons should be durable enough to handle the weight of records. We recommend that uh, agencies and local governments use triple corrugated cardboard containers, uh, such as those called Liberty or Page boxes, to uh, store their inactive records. We've also found, based on past experience at the Records Center, that the uh, more sturdy boxes can actually help protect records in cases of water events, if there's a flood or something like that. Sometimes you're out of luck, but other times we found that actually the lids will protect some uh, damage to the contents of their boxes inside. Finally, you need to create good box tracking data, ideally in a database or spreadsheet, so that each box's contents are searchable and linked up with their appropriate schedule item and disposition date. And we'll talk about this more in a little bit. Here's an example of the types of boxes we're talking about, the very sturdy cardboard boxes that are, that are sitting here on a pallet. I want to mention this uh, for a couple reasons. First, to encourage agencies and local governments, again, to use the better quality boxes, not just uh, bankers boxes or uh, packing boxes, but really to invest the, the time up front to use good quality materials. As you can see our, here on this pallet, by looking at this pallet at least, you can imagine that safety is an important concern that we're dealing with here whenever you prepare records for inactive storage or if you manage your own facility. It's very important to be concerned to palletize records correct, correctly, not putting them in big columns which could topple over, but rather to stack them and interlock the boxes on the pallets. Also, if you're using power equipment such as electric pallet jacks, manual jacks, or forklifts in your inactive facility, be sure that your staff have the appropriate OSHA training and certification to do so. And we'd be happy to answer any questions about that uh, if, you, if you do have them. And you can certainly contact the State Records Center or your RAO for more information. As part of your records processing work, you'll need to determine what records should be stored in each box and how to effectively store them. Of course, the temptation is just to throw everything together by year and place things in a box, not really sort through the contents. This may seem convenient at the time, but of course, over the long haul, it's going to be difficult to manage those records long term. As we talked about before, it's important to keep things separate by record series. So one box should only contain one record series only. If that's impractical, at least limit yourself to records with the same retention period in a box so that everything can be disposed of together at the appropriate time. If you store records in a single box with different retention periods, know that you must keep the entire box for as long as the longest retention of records in that box, or you need to invest the time and resources to go through and weed out material that can be disposed of. And of course, this is also important because you don't want to waste valuable storage space on your shelves with records you could have disposed of years earlier. Also note that storage boxes should not contain things such as hanging folders or binders. These are expensive and really for only, only for office use only. They take up a lot of space and, and they weigh a good deal too. Also note that if you do use the state waste paper contract, the vendor will not accept boxes with these things in them or with boxes that contain electronic media like CDs and discs. Everything must be weeded out before those boxes are picked up for shredding and recycling. Boxes should not be overpacked either. A full box, as Michael indicated earlier, should weigh about 35 pounds and have enough space so that people can retrieve records easily. 
Finally, it's a good idea to make sure that any records uh, that are in the box that are folded up are appropriately folded and placed in the correct direction. Don't just again throw documents in the box, but again, take the time to go through and process those records. It's also important to consider the types of labels you'll be using. This is another part of good organization of your inactive files. Labels are required for all boxes put in your inactive storage area. It's important to use uniform labels on all boxes so people know what to, that they're going to be looking for. Use the same size labels. You can use pre-printed labels. However, a word of caution about these is to make sure to only include the necessary information on the labels that you need. You can certainly put information like series title, date ranges, and departments. However, remember that the less information you put on each label, the greater the security for, their box, for the boxes themselves. At the State Records Center, we actually recommend to agencies that they write only the agency code number, their transfer list number, and the box number on those boxes for added security while in storage. We certainly don't encourage them to uh, put a description of the contents of the box on the outside. We manage the more detailed information about those boxes on the transfer list and in our inventory management system. It's important to think about the type of label you're using too. Make sure to choose ones with good adhesive. Foil back labels are generally the best. Uh, paper or gummed labels tend to fall off, especially if the humidity or moisture in the storage area is high. And again, this is why we encourage state agencies to put those three critical pieces of information on the box with marker so that if a label does fall off over time, we can reconstruct the provenance of the box. Finally, as the coordinator for inactive storage, make sure you supply each unit or department in your organization with labels for the boxes they send to you or, the, or boxes that if they're gonna be shipped out to an external vendor so that they arrive um, in, in good condition. And finally, if you're managing your own inactive facility, you'll also need to maintain a log of all the barcoded labels uh, or other labels that you submit, that you send to agencies or departments. And it's a good idea to track these by the barcode number ranges that you print, to whom you issue them, and the date on which they're issued. Just a word about access to records while they're in active storage. Of course, uh, a popular option to consider is reformatting, especially by digitization. You can certainly consider reformatting paper or microfilm records to digital images um, and destroying the original, perhaps. However, note that if you do destroy the original paper, you must create a digital image at a high enough quality for preservation. And we have some more information on our website through our digital imaging guidelines that you're welcome to take a look at. So when you're thinking about inactive storage, it's always important to consider the cost benefit. Uh, if you're considering digitization and, and destroying the originals, for example, the records should be so highly used or they should have a long enough retention period to make it worth your while. You know, anything under like 10 years, for example, it's best to just retain the paper for the length of the retention period. And finally, you need to think about maintaining access to the records for the length of the retention period. It's not good enough to simply just scan or reformat materials and then forget about them. You must think about uh, access to the full records over the course of their retention periods. No matter the type of inactive facility you have, or if it's being operated internally or externally by a vendor or by like the State Records Center, you need to have a good locator system to maintain access to your records. Even a spreadsheet or a Word document can be useful than, than having nothing. With a database or spreadsheet locator system, you can enhance access and retrieval of records. These locator files will provide you with an efficient way of tracking boxes. And you can record the core information about each box through these systems. You know, the series title, the location, uh, the dates, the creating department, and barcode number. If you, use a, if you use a good enough locator system that allows you to scan by barcode number, you can even tie these into those systems so that you can track the actual location of boxes. At the State Records Center, for example, we do do that and we, we survive on our ability to do that. When we down, download barcode locations, we can see exactly where a given box is, whether it's on the shelf in the warehouse, uh, in a holding area, or maybe even checked out to a state agency. If you have questions about sample records management database applications that you can use, please contact us at the State Archives. 
Finally, note that commercial records management software can certainly fill this need. Uh, these are the most sophisticated solutions out there. Uh, note that the systems, while they provide all the bells and whistles you'll need, they do come at a much higher cost, but they do give your departments the potential to interact directly with the storage facility. Uh, for example, departments can enter in their own box information, they can approve disposition of records, and even request boxes from inactive storage, all within the commercial software. Your inactive records, of course, will eventually satisfy their legally mandated retention period, and it will come, it will come time to apply disposition. Depending on what type of facility you're running, of course, and the level of control you have, this may work in different ways. For example, you may need to identify and pull boxes yourself if you have your own storage area, or if you're working with a vendor or the state records center, you'll communicate with that uh, entity to ensure that boxes are okay to be dispositioned at that time. There are a few things to keep in mind here that, you know, disposition can have many different types. Of course, we think about destruction of the records, but of course, records may also need to be kept permanently or even transferred to an archival facility. There are times where you may need to suspend disposition of records. For example, if, you're, if your department or agency is experiencing an audit or litigation, or perhaps if there's a new law on the books that, that requires you to keep records for a longer period of time. Sometimes, for example, a new law comes into place and the retention schedule may not have been updated quite yet. But of course, that law may require you to keep records for a much longer period of time. As you think about disposition, it's really important to uh, keep running reports and assessing the data you have so that you make sure you clear up valuable shelf space. Also, be sure to, duck, to check and double check your work as you go along. You certainly wanna make sure that you pull the correct boxes for destruction and not incorrect boxes. Finally, you wanna document all destruction decisions that you take. As we discussed earlier, the records destruction authorization form that we have on our website is a very good idea. And even at the State Records Center, we make sure to generate monthly spreadsheets of all box barcodes that we send to the waste paper vendor for destruction. And we keep these in our own files, in addition to updating our warehouse inventory system. We think it's very important to have a complete paper trail with the agencies that we serve. So we also keep any email printouts and such of any requests that they make for box extensions and other requests. Also, as we discussed earlier, make sure to confirm whether records need confidential shredding when they come up for disposition. Before we conclude today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of keeping policies and procedures you have in writing so that you can effectively manage your inactive facilities. By documenting your policies and procedures, you'll achieve a number of important things. First and foremost, you'll promote your program's permanence. You'll ensure that your inactive records program succeeds you. Think about when you first started in the role. Did you have something you could follow or a person to rely on? Putting down policies and procedures in writing assures your successors will have a good program to follow. This also helps to re reinforce uniform practices. Establishing a set of rules makes it easier for all staff to follow them. It also makes uh, staff turnover and transitions easier and smoother if you have documentation. This also aids in staff training. By having documented policies and procedures, new staff will learn how the program functions and this will even reinforce methods and procedures for established staff. There'll be less confusion overall about what needs to be done. By documenting procedures in a step-by-step -step way, this will also ensure the success of your inactive program. We've covered this in a few areas today, for example, in discussing uh, disposition of records, making it clear to staff on a step-by-step -step level what they need to do. Finally, by putting these policies and procedures in writing, this will establish and set clear responsibilities and guidance for who carries out certain tasks and what is expected of the various entities involved, whether the program units, the RMOs, or even the external facility coordinators. And of course, you can always find more information about records management topics and inactive storage in a number of places, such as the State Archives website, where we have an entire section dedicated to managing your records. Also, if you're interested in learning more about the State Records Center procedures, you can find information in forms geared toward uh, 
art management of the uh, State Records Center. State Archives publications are also available on our website. They're free and they cover many topics. All are available in PDF format. Also, you may wish to attend other State Archives workshops and webinars like this one. Other sessions may supplement this one and cover additional areas of interest. See our website for a full schedule and our YouTube channel for recordings of past records management webinars and trainings. We're always here to help at the State Archives. If you have any questions, if you're a local government, please contact your records advisory officer. The RAO can provide you with direct advice based on a review of current storage conditions, and they can help you prepare a grant application for inactive records work. And for state agencies, the Scheduling and State Agency Services Unit is here to provide records management training, assistance in creating and updating agency-specific schedules, and help with agencies' use of the State Records Center. Finally, it's a good idea to network with others who set up and maintain inactive records programs. Learn from their experience. Records management organizations like ARMA and Niagara can provide efficient networking as well as other organizations like the Association of Towns. Also, there is a, a group of RMOs and state agencies that are now beginning to meet after the pandemic to discuss a number of topics that are common to state agency needs. So there are different sources of information out there to assist you. Before we conclude today, just to review a number of points we discussed. Uh, it's important, of course, at the, at the outset to evaluate storage facilities you need to be able to decide the type and location of the facility that you want, something in-house or something external. And remember the checklist that Michael shared with you earlier if you do decide to um, implement your own inactive storage facility. It's important to determine space and other considerations that you need. Remember to consult the formula we suggested earlier on and always remember to allow for 30% growth of your holdings. As you process and prepare records for inactive storage, Consider issues related to organization and access. You'll need to be answer, you'll need to answer some key questions here. Uh, for example, do you know how to process and transfer records for inactive storage? Do you know what paperwork and permissions will be required? And do you know where you'll store the records and how to make sure that records are stored for the length of their retention periods? Also, once your records are organized, how will you, how will you be able to find them? Remember to implement a good locator system that can track your boxes. You want to write down the policies and procedures you decide to implement. Documenting these will make things much easier for others. When it comes to the question of who is in charge of something, this is where your policies will come into play. Writing things down for new people is, is, is certainly beneficial because it, it should make it obvious to them what needs to be done and hopefully why it should be done. Finally, the State Archives is here to help we have many online resources and can provide one-on-one -on -one consult training, consult, excuse me, one-on-one -on -one consultra consultation and individualized training for local governments and state agencies to help you with all your records management activities, including inactive record storage and so much more. We want to say thank you very much for listening today, and we hope this has been a helpful and easy to understand session. And now I think we have some time for some questions. So I will pass this back to Sarah. We do, we have time for questions. We do have a couple that have been pre-submitted. However, folks, if you have questions, please load them up into the chat at this time so that we can try to get as, to as many as we can before 11 o'clock. So the first question that we have is from Barbara. Um, her question is, we combined our court with the town court and we no longer have the court here at the village office. Could we store our court documents up at the town building with them if we rent space from them? I'll give that one a try. I, I would think so. Uh, it would make sense to me that you could store store them. You just want to make sure that they're clearly identified as separate from from the town. And if there is, you know, information that's confidential or what have you, that they're separated in some sort of way that maybe has a, a cage or, or something else so that they're clearly identified and not everyone has access. Awesome, thank you, Michael. The next question we have is from Kim. What kind of inventory management system does the state use? Is this something that can be used by local governments? 
Yeah, I can tackle that one. Um, we currently use a system called Gain 2000. Um, it, uh, it can essentially perform the functions we need it to. However, we recognize uh, some of the limitations that it has, and we're actually starting to now move toward a, a commercial uh, inventory management system. But we'd be happy to talk to you more if you'd be interested in using Gain or uh, something like that. We can talk about some of the, uh, the, the pros and cons with the system. And we also have a basic, very, very bare bones access database for local governments to help organize their records. Uh, it includes information on a locator system and you can pull up reports and, and that sort of thing. We can only provide it via a zip file at this time. So if your email system cannot allow zip files, we won't be able to transfer it, unfortunately. But you can contact your records advisory officer for more information on that. All right, awesome. And the next question we have, and I did, I, I took the liberty of looking these up for you guys. Um, Thomas asked if he, about the records retention, retention for records destruction. Um, and I looked those up. So your retention, the retention for those records um, in the LGS one, because I'm not quite sure which government type you're with, sir. Um, for the LGS one, you're looking for item number 88, and for the general schedule, you're looking for item 90347. We have a question from Yarlis. Um, I apologize if I did not pronounce that correctly. Could you type the name of those systems in the chat? And Joseph um, asks if the IMS name is Gain 2000. Yes, that's right. The one I mentioned is Gain 2000. And Maria just mentioned that the access database is in the forms and tool page for download. So that's great. Thank you for that reminder. I wasn't yeah. sure if it was available and if it had been updated to the most recent version, because I know previously people had problems with um, updating a older version. So thank you. And I'm throwing a chat or a link for forms and tools in the chat. All right, we have a couple more minutes if anybody has questions. But it does look like we might get some contacts. Um, so, gentlemen, be, pre be prepared to have your inboxes flooded. Happy to help. Problem. Yeah. All right. Looks like things are pretty quiet. Um, if folks could, please, if you're sitting with more than one person watching this, um, throw that the number of people you're with in the chat, just so we know about how many people we've reached today. And with that, I think we have had, oh, oh we have a question, we have a question, apologies. Linda has a question. Are you, you mentioned checking for insects, et cetera, earlier. Are there any that are particularly attracted to paper, like cockroaches? I know in, um... In areas where there's high uh, humidity, uh, that silverfish can be a problem. Um, we experience that with uh, when we take in records sometimes from, you know, that have been stored in a barn or, or a garage or something like that over over a period of time. Um, like Michael pointed out at the State Records Center, we do have a, a vendor we work with who uh, sets traps and, and and monitors the situation. We also try to monitor those as part of our walkthroughs of the facility. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, but that's that, yeah, that's been one of the more uh, nuisance nuisances we've had to deal with in some other occasions, the uh, silverfish I know. Yeah, there's the insects and then of course there's, there's rodents as well. And of course rodents love paper. So, uh, that that's another issue as well. And that's part of that daily walkthrough, making sure that you're evaluating any kind of potential issue and. Unfortunately, or, or fortunately, um, animals and insects leave be leave behind traces of them. So you can you can quickly track down where where one may be, unless they're hidden away in the boxes, and then you got a whole other issue. Yeah, and that's a very good point that Michael brings up is kind of that constant monitoring, and even with temperature and relative humidity, you know, you can buy these things called data loggers that will 
you know, they'll give you the temperature and relative humidity readings. We've actually been doing that a lot uh, recently at our state record center uh, to make sure make sure we have uh, consistent uh, levels. And a lot of them allow you to download the data into a program, and you can you know you can track it that way over time. You can see the the levels of fluctuation over time. So. All right, it is 11 o'clock, so I think we're going to let everybody go. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out via email. We're happy to answer whatever questions that we get in. And thank you so much, gentlemen, for presenting today and everybody for who joined us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. All right. Thank you. Have a good thank one, you, everyone. everyone. Thank you.